Finish the songs. Please stand and join us.
But I like it when, when, when Michael said, all right, your turn. What's that called? Call and response. Yeah, that's what it's called, what he said. I was like, hey, they sound, I'm, I'm backstage. I'm like, they sound good too, don't they? Yeah. I could actually like hear you singing, which was really cool. So thanks for joining us. If you're joining us live online, hope that you are singing as well. Uh, we're so excited that each and every single one of you are here. We really do believe that today can be filled with hope because we believe that you can encounter a God who loves you. So if this is your first time today, welcome to Encounter Church. Hope that you're singing loud and uh, joining us as well. We'd love for you to download our app. That's how you can engage with the message a little bit later on to, um, today. You can learn a little bit more about us. Encounterchurch.com forward slash app. We'd love for you to fill out the connection card as well. When you uh, came in the door, you received a connection card later in the service. And you can fill out the connection card, place that in the offering basket as it goes around the room. And so that would be awesome for you to let us know a little bit of who you are. As you get to know us, we'd love to get to know you. We're going to continue in a great series today that our pastor is going to come after we sing a few more songs. And uh, we're uh, looking forward to a great Sunday. Once again, thanks for being at Encounter Church. We hope the rest of this hour is a great hour for you.
very soon. Ever had anything stolen that was significant? I, I hadn't before. And then June of this year, in the middle of an incredibly stressful season, we were getting ready for our At The Movie series, which is something that we do yearly here, um, which requires a ton of work behind the scenes. We have to take a movie, we have to edit it down, we have to pre-record the messages, put it all together. On top of that, we were doing wiring because hidden up in the ceiling is a screen that drops down. So all of that was pretty pretty stressful. It was here till late night. Our team was working late. And in the middle of that, I was also trying to finish up my schooling. And then it's about 10.30 p.m. and I get a phone call. And over $2,000 had been stolen out of our savings account, and, uh, which is a lot of money for us. And I was like, I'm sorry, what? Uh, yeah, someone had hacked into your bank account and had transferred money. And so it's $2,000 has been stolen. And we're calling the bank and 24-7 uh, customer service. Um, I guess that night the, the, the B team was working because they didn't seem to really care that 2,000 of our dollars had just been taken. And they're like, well, you know, come in tomorrow. We'll work through it. And we're like, what do you mean work through it? Like, where is this guy? Where is this girl? Like, can you send a SWAT team? Can you get my money back? How do you people not know where my money is? It literally came from you and went somewhere else. You can't track that. Sir, I'm sorry. It's, a, it's, it's past business hours. I can take your name. I'll have someone follow up with you. And so the next morning, hours upon hours are spent in the bank and then canceling and, you know, doing the whole whole like auto debit reshuffle in life where you're having to change your cards because this person has seen everything. They had our entire banking account that we've been locked out of for security reasons. And um, I remember the, the, the day after and driving down the road and in the midst of the investigation, one of the things that kind of popped up on our credit was uh, the way they transferred their money. They had to use a cell phone. So now I have their cell phone number. And I'm driving down the road, and I'm just angry. I'm ruminating. I'm thinking about how they've taken $2,000. It's going to be seven to ten business days before it comes back. We have no recourse. Um, we're having to cancel our accounts. I'm having to spend all these. In the midst of preparing for the, at the movie series and needing to film and all that, I am so mad. And I'm driving down the road, and I'm like, I, you know what? And I dial the cell phone number because I want to talk to this person. And they're just like, ring, 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 ring. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I can't wait till they answer. Oh, I'm going to let them know how I think and what I think about them taking money from me. Come and do that to my face, I'm thinking, in my head. And then while I'm driving, a small voice whispers inside of my head, are you an idiot? What are you going to do if they answer? I'm like, well, I'm going to tell them how I think. Well, you don't know who they are. But they know everything about you. They know your mother's maiden name. They know where you live. They know your address. They have all of that information. On top of that, they know my dog, my first pet's name was Booty. That's a separate story. But they now know that because that was a security question. It doesn't work anymore, so don't worry. But they know that, Chris. No one knows your first pet's name was Booty. 
And if they answer, you are stuck because you have no clue who they are, but they know everything about you. And so I quickly hung up. Angry and mad, frustrated because I'd been violated. But what that moment did for me, what that moment pointed to, was something that's unique about money. Something that's special about time and money that really doesn't seem to kind of fill out in any other area of our life. And it's this thing, this unique trait, characteristic, whatever you want to call it, about money, about time, that's at the heart of what we have to overcome and to engage with if we're going to live a life that's rich. And what I want to do is take you to a letter that was written 2,000 years ago. In fact, it's the same letter we looked at a couple weeks ago because there's just so much in that section of the letter that I want to spend time processing through that I didn't even have time to fully process two weeks ago. It's a letter written to a guy named Timothy, and it's the first letter, which is why it's called First Timothy. It's in the New Testament, and it was written by a man named Paul. Paul is the kind of the first prolific writer in the Christian faith. He writes a bulk of the New Testament. Most of the New Testament letters, the majority of them, were written by Paul. Paul experiences a radical life change. He'd been essentially a domestic terrorist towards Christians. He had made his living. He had made his reputation known by systematically arresting and killing Christians as it was beginning to grow in first century. Um, And and then in the course of a trip, he has this incredible incredibly life-altering moment with Jesus, and he changes his name so that he kind of marks that moment. He's like, look, it's been, my life is so radically different that it's not okay for people to call me Saul anymore. People need to start calling me Paul, because that's the, that's the amount of transformation I've experienced. I'm a new man. And so this guy, Paul, has a protege named Timothy, and he writes this letter to Timothy to help lead Timothy as he's leading a church in Ephesus. And Ephesus was a pretty influential, wealthy city. Uh, It's one of the the wealthiest in the Roman Empire at the time. It's still a place where tourists travel today because the archaeological findings, the temple, which was one of the original seven wonders of the world, the, the amphitheater that's still present there today, this place was an incredibly wealthy, influential, important place back then which meant that the people who lived there were unique. They were rich. In an ancient Roman empire, these people lived a life of luxury that few people lived. In fact, archaeological digs have found that the houses in Ephesus, the wealthies, the wealthy homes there, had running water, hot and cold. Think about that. 2,000 years ago, houses having running Hot and cold water. That's incredible. That's something that you think happened in the last 200 years. But these people were so technologically advanced, they were so wealthy, that they actually were able to afford to set up the infrastructure to have running water. On top of that, they also discovered uh, essentially what would be equivalent to radiant heat systems today. They had heat inside their homes. So these people were in a class completely distinct and different from the average Roman citizen scattered throughout the Roman Empire. And so Paul writes to Timothy and says, Timothy, I want you to learn how to speak to them and teach them. I want you to, the first word in verse 17, I want you to command them. He says in verse 17 of chapter 6, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. And in this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. What's unique is that Paul uses this phrase that in the Greek would have stood out to Timothy. We we see the word in English, it says just simply command. But it's a unique word. It's a military term, in fact. It was a word that Roman soldiers would have been intimately familiar with. It was that call to arms. It was that call to action. It was that, that, that word that would be spoken by the commander to his troops to tell them, hey, it's time to move to a new location. 
This word command is picked by Paul on purpose because he's trying to communicate something. Hey, you... Timothy, I want you to communicate to these people that where they're currently standing, the way they currently think about their wealth is wrong, and they need to move to a new place. They need to move out to this new way of thinking, this new way of living. Command them. Give them the order, marching orders to move on to that better, different place, that space and place that's truly rich, that's truly life. And he has to give this command because what happens as he goes out in verse 17 and unpacks it a little bit is that most of us, if we're not careful, we end up standing in this camp thinking about wealth from this perspective and vantage point. So he says, command those who are wealthy not to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. He, he points to one of the things that causes us to, to stay over here and to camp out in this place is that we have a tendency to equate our security to our salary. We have a tendency to see our confidence tied to our bank statements or to what we're able to do with a card and a signature. That's a, a, a genuine struggle that we have. We tend to view our security, our confidence through the lens of how much cash we have on hand and in our accounts. And this is something that's present during this day. A contemporary, the, the emperor who would have been uh, ruling in Rome while Jesus was being executed on the cross, a guy named Tiberius. Tiberius uh, was once presented a rare gift by a goldsmith. The goldsmith came in and said, oh, great emperor Tiberius, I've, I've made something for you that is the most rare thing on earth. And he presents the emperor with what is essentially an aluminum plate. Okay, so aluminum foil wrap, kind of made into a plate. And he gives the emperor aluminum, which at the time was the rarest metal on planet Earth. The reason why is because aluminum, though it's one of the most common metals in the soil today, is one of the most difficult metals to extract. It wasn't until around 18, mid-1800s that in uh, kind of concert with researchers in France that the U.S. and France came upon a method of extracting aluminum that made it as commonplace as we have today with aluminum foil, with aluminum cans, right? Aluminum is not something that we view as a rare material, but for Tiberius, it was the only one of its kind on planet Earth. And Tiberius gets the aluminum plate he destroys it and then kills the goldsmith. And the reason why was because Tiberius understood that if this goldsmith had just presented to him something that was more rare and worth more than the gold he had in his storehouses, then his gold in his storehouses wouldn't be worth anything because now aluminum would be the metal of value and the, the metal of worth. And it kind of betrays this fact that oftentimes, if we're not careful, we view our security through the lens of what's in our statements. But that's not the only thing. It's also that most of us don't feel rich. Right? We've, we talked about this two weeks ago. Most of us don't feel rich because we don't have margin in our lives. That's why this uh, today, uh, um, from 1 to 3 p.m., we're doing a free class called Finding Financial Freedom because we want to help everyone in this room be able to find financial margin in their lives. You and I... We are made to flourish in margin. This is built into the Christian faith, in fact. We are made to flourish, um, flourish in margin of time, which is why the Sabbath was created, this idea of having a day set apart in the week where you could have breathing room, where you could kind of take a breath and not be overworked and overextended in your schedule, and this whole idea of giving and tithing so that you could live with financial margin, so that you wouldn't live overextended in your financial. Like, this is at the core of Christian faith, is this idea of margin. And when you don't have margin, you don't feel rich. You feel stressed. You feel overtaxed. You feel overwhelmed. In fact, the only time you've probably ever felt rich was probably the same time I felt rich, your first job. You worked really hard. Someone handed you a paycheck. And it was the first time you had ever gotten handed a paycheck. And you're like, this for me? Are you kidding me? And then you go to the bank and you cash it and they count it out and you're like, count it in tens. <laughs> it's like 10, 20, 30, right? And, and then they put it in your hand and you're like, 
man, I wonder if I could fill a swimming pool up and swim in this. Like, I've just never had this. And you walk out with that cash in hand, and you're like, I'm rich. I can buy anything. I can do anything. And it's because for a moment, you have margin. That feeling of, wow, I've got it. Maybe it wasn't your first job. Maybe it was the first time you ever got an allowance. I'm watching this play out with my little six-year-old right now. Um, She just had a a cash windfall from a little uh, yard sale we had uh, two months ago. And because she was willing to contribute some of her old toys to be sold and her old baby supplies to be sold, which she did not buy, by the way, um, so that we were like, hey, we will give you the, the revenue from it. And so she ended up making $27 that day. And that girl's like 27 and ones and 50 cents. I mean, she's like, I'm rich. And the last two months, literally every time we have a conversation, she's like, I want to do that. And we're like, oh, well, that costs money, sweetie. You know, we have a budget. Like, we have guidelines. And she's like, it's okay. I got cash. (laughs) I'm like, you realize you have $27. Like, you can't even eat in half the restaurants around us with $27. But in her little mind, she's got margin. She's got, that money is not going anywhere. And so in her mind, she can spend it on anything. I mean, we almost daily have a conversation where she's like, it's okay, I got cash. I can pay for it. I'm like, you have $27. Only in the dollar spot at Target are you rich right now. Okay, sweetie? But when we have this margin, it, it creates this sense of like, I'm rich, I've got it. And because most of us don't experience margin, in our lives, we don't consider ourselves rich. And then to, to further make the point, right, if you went back to that person who got that first paycheck, that old version of you, and you whispered to them, for most of us, not all of us, but I, for most of us, if you whispered to that person when they got that first paycheck, hey, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, you're going to get a paycheck that has this number on it, they would have fallen out. You would have fallen out and been like, oh, my goodness, I'm going to be rich when I grow up. Because most of us, what we make or what we've made, our, our younger version of ourselves would think we're loaded. And yet most of us don't feel that way. And it's because I think one of it is what one of my mentors says is this consumption assumption that we make, that whatever we get is meant to be spent on us. And so what happens is our salary goes up, our standards adjust with it. Our salary goes up again, our standards continue to climb. And so we're essentially marching and moving the goalpost down to the field, and so we never get to a place of margin because we just readjust. It's the consumption assumption, as he likes to call it. And what Paul was trying to do was Paul was trying to, to paint a picture of richness that was different than what this camp had in mind, because this is what they thought about riches. And so what Paul's trying to do is he's like, command them. He's like, move forward. Go to this different place. Think about life differently. Think about wealth differently. Command them to be rich in what? To be rich in doing good. To be rich in good deeds. To be generous and willing to share. He's wanting them to realize that there's a different way of living life. It's the same reason, actually. I think it's pointing to this deeper thing that... He's trying to make the point that being rich is not about what you store up in life. It's about how you spend your life. It's not what you store and you save. It's how you spend your life. And there's a subtlety in what I just said that speaks to why I got so angry that day when I'm driving down the road and it makes me call this person who stole money that knows everything about me in righteous indignation. The reason is because when you... Most of us, the way we make our money is that we show up in some place, some space, whether it's digital or physical, whether it's in a retail, whether it's in a a building that's really tall, or whether it's in our home office or a hospital. But we make our money by showing up and giving the most precious commodity we have, our life. And we say, hey, I'm going to give you my life from these set hours. In exchange, you're going to give me little slips of cotton and linen paper that's been dyed green. That's what I'm going to do in this exchange. I'm going to give you my life, and out of that exchange, you're going to give me little pieces of cotton linen strips that we call dollar bills. And that's going to be how we do this thing. Because what money really is, is congealed life. It's condensed life. 
When you hold a paycheck, what you're physically holding is the life that you gave away in exchange for that slip of paper. And the reason that money invokes something so deep down inside is that someone had not stolen my money. They had stolen a piece of my life from me. They had taken that from me. And it made me mad. Because the most precious, irreplaceable thing that I have is my life and time. And it had been taken. And money is congealed life. It's condensed life that's been exchanged for little slips of cotton and linen, linen papers. And this is why when we talk about what richness really is, we even use this phrase sometimes about how we spend our time, how we spend our life. It's because intuitively we recognize that money is congealed life and that time, that that's one of the, the ways that we can spend our lives. And so Paul is trying to say, hey, let's move from this way of thinking about rich, which is all about storing. It's all about a kind of a false sense of security. Let's move to what it looks like to be rich, which is how you spend your life, how you give your life away. And it's not just tied to money because it's all about life. God does not care about cotton and linen strips of paper. That's not what he's about. He doesn't need little strips of green cotton and linen fibers. What he wants, what he cares about is how we spend our lives. That we spend our lives in a way that's actually truly reflective of the quality and the nature and the importance of what life is to begin with. And so he says, how do you spend your life? He said, command them to do good, to leverage their lives, to be rich in good deeds, to to make it a point daily with decision, because a command is the decision you follow. To look for those opportunities to see the good that you could do. To look for the moments where you could engage in a good deed, where you can make a difference, where you can spend your life to actually invest it in something that is worth investing in it. it and he uses some different kind of words that, again, because we're reading it in the English, we can miss some of the nuancy terms. He's talking about doing good in a life that's leveraging our lives for others' goods. And then he's talking about doing good deeds and these small things and the little things and the big things. And then he's talking about uh, one of the words he talks is the good. He uses a word that we would um, call benevolence, which is helping those who are in um, difficult places in life. It's one of the words he's trying to point to is that one of the ways that we can be rich is by helping those who are poor or in a place in life right now where they can't make ends meet. Because not everyone's rich. And he's speaking to those groups of people. But then he uses this very interesting word. At the end of this sentence, he points to a word that um, is a hard word to translate in the English. But remember, this is written in first century. So you're a first century educated, wealthy individual. You would have heard a word that would have invoked a lot of meaning for you. He uses a word that's a version of a word called koinonia, which is uh, this really hard to understand concept that's really rich. But for the ancient Roman and Greeks, koinonia was associated with utopia. It was, it was associated with the ideal world. It, it, was this, it was the equivalent of heaven on earth, in fact. Like, what does it look like to have a community that's essentially heaven on earth? This is, he ends his whole phrasing of commanding richness by pointing them to this picture of bringing heaven to earth in the way that they live their lives. And this isn't lofty speech. This isn't some like religious phrasing that heaven on earth. He's calling them to a life that's rich, a life that's known not for what it stores up, but how it spends it. And for most of us, you've never, we've never spent time studying early church history. All we know is what we see in the headlines about church today or last week. And let's just be real. Can I be very candid? I hate the headlines I read in the newspapers that I see about church. It's devastating. It's tragic. It's, it's wrong. But what we see that's been done under the label and the banner of the church and Jesus to people. Because what was originally supposed to be the headline of the church, what was originally supposed to be the banner for who the church is, and what the church does is what Paul's alluding to here. He says, heaven on earth. 
If you go back and you study church history, what you find is the early church did not have headlines like what we read in the globe. They had a whole different set of headlines. Christianity was illegal for the first two to three hundred years of its existence. They didn't meet in rooms like this because this was outlawed. There wasn't public speakers broadcasting over the Internet. Even if there'd been the Internet then, it would have been a lot like China today. You couldn't do that. It's illegal. So how did Christianity go within 300 years from an illegal group of people in the outskirts of the Roman Empire in Jerusalem with a rabbi who claimed to be God? How did it go from that to the majority of the Roman Empire becoming Christians? The way it happened was this. This is how it happened. You see, what would happen in the midst of uh, ancient Rome and the Roman Empire was epidemics and fires, tragedies would happen. There was no government welfare system. So when people, when people thought about security, they, there was no, never a point in their mind where you could depend on the government. If you could not make ends meet, the government never stepped in to help make those ends meet. The Roman Empire, the general Roman understanding of the day did not value life. It saw life as something that could be kind of tossed aside. One of the most tragic things about the early Roman Empire was they had a belief somewhat akin to with the one child policy that China had for, for a season, this idea of an em- emphasize, where if you had a child and you, for whatever reason, thought it wasn't going to help your family, you would just stick it outside and leave it and try to have another one. So there was not a value of life from old to young and everything in between. Lesser of these were treated and discarded. So this was a brutal place to grow up and live. And yet, how does the early church live? The early church is known, the headlines that they write are headlines of love and compassion. When epidemics would hit these uh, cases of different sicknesses, whether it was the flu or some version, ancient version of uh, the plague or whatever, what would happen is the society, the Roman society of the day, would see that as divine judgment, and so they would flee the cities. They would leave. They'd get out because they would say, these sick people, obviously the gods are angry at them. And the ones that would rush in, the people who would nurse and take care of and, and minister to people in their last days or last few hours, the ones who would give them burials that were appropriate, that would honor them, the ones who would feed them and water them and give them the basic necessities of life were the Christians. They ran to people who were dying and they nurtured them, they loved them, they served them, they took care of them. Rodney Stark has a collection of books where he documents in historical records how the early church was known for how they loved and how they served. It got so, the headlines were so big that these Christians, these weirdos, were so aggressive in how they loved and served and gave away their property that at one point the Roman government starts to try to copy Christians because they realize that the Christians have better PR, the Christians are well liked, and that the Roman government structure that depended on the belief that the emperor was God, they say, well, we need to prop this thing back up. So they started setting up priests who were copying how the Christians were living their lives. This is history. They were trying to mimic the way that the church loved, the way that the church served, the way that the church sacrificed, the way they ran to disaster, the way they ran to the suffering instead of running from them like so many other people in the Roman Empire did. And what happened was that the church was living this out. They heard Paul. They marched to this place and with good deeds, with generosity, with sacrifice, they manifested heaven on earth. They gave people a picture of what it looked like for love. That's a verb when love does. They made the teaching of Jesus, the rabbi, real to people. And this eventually transformed the entire Roman Empire. And so by the time Constantine comes into place and makes Christianity the official state religion, Christianity is already the unofficial state religion because of the number of people who'd begin begin to follow and believe that the resurrected rabbi named Jesus was in fact God Almighty, who had come to make a way for humanity to be restored to him.
And this powerful thing was born out of a belief that richness is about how you spend your life, not just what you store up in life. Paul never condemns being rich. Paul never criticizes them for having resources. What Paul is more concerned about is that they live their lives understanding that all the resources we have is meant to be spent in this life to make a difference, understanding that there's more to life than just what we see. Because the reality is that the only thing that you and I invest in that's truly going to last forever are people. The only thing that you lock eyes with that will stay and continue to exist long after this earth does not are people. This is the big if, right? That's why you see in verse 19 where um, Paul writes the words that in this, way, in this way they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. This is why Paul ends this whole section with this idea around this huge significant if. Because in Christian, if Christianity is not true, if Jesus, this rabbi who resurrects, comes back from the dead three days after he's crucified, if that didn't really happen in history, then we are wasting our time. And this could be a, a concert hall. This could be an art gallery. This could be something else. I could go work at the Apple store or code or do something with my nerdness. Like I, we're just wasting our time. But if that rabbi walked out of the grave three days later, if that is real, then it changes everything. That belief will affect how we change our behaviors. When you believe that God Almighty walked out of the grave after he made a way for us to be restored in our relationship with him, when you believe that has happened, then all of a sudden it's really easy to recognize your security is not in your paycheck. It's in the person who conquered death when he walked out of the grave. If he's able to do that, then surely he can take care of me. Surely he can provide for me. If you recognize that the rabbi has walked out of the grave, then it does change how we live our lives. It changed how we treat people because we recognize that buildings will collapse, that nation states will fall, but people will last forever. It changes how we speak to these very ordinary, immortal beings that we call family and friends. Understanding that our words have impact that will last forever. When you start to see life through the frame of what Paul's talking about, it changes. In fact, I said I was a nerd. Let me show you how much of a nerd I am. So I'm holding in my hand the week's salary of a Roman soldier. So in my hand are the coins that would have been paid to a Roman soldier for giving a week of his life. He would have exchanged his life that week for what I hold in my hand. These bronze coins. He would have sacrificed his life in battle. He would have stepped into difficult circumstances, not knowing if he was going to go home to see his family. He would have been away from creature comforts of the city, marching through really difficult landscapes, doing whatever the commander told him to do. Like this was what he was being given in exchange for every one of his hours spent serving as a Roman soldier for a week. And when Paul says lay up treasure, he's encouraging us to see our lives through the grander scale that our life has really meant to be lived. To invest our lives in the things that's worth investing in. People and what God is trying to do in the midst of lives around us. Because Paul understood something. That Roman soldier who would give up his week, who would suffer and sacrifice. His treasure is now my trinket. It means nothing. If I walk into a store today and I try to pay with this, no one is going to give me food. They're going to laugh at me. This means absolutely nothing. It's a trinket that sits on my desk. It's a historical artifact. And yet so much of the Roman pursuit of the day was spent trying to collect this. And today, it means nothing. 
They scoop up these things in archaeological digs all the time, and you can buy huge bags of them for next to nothing. Stuff that was once treasure is now treated as trash in archaeological digs. And Paul understood that if we're not careful, we'll fall into this trap of seeing richness as about what we store up in this life instead of seeing richness about how we're meant to spend our lives to impact the lives of those around us. And as a church, we take that passion, we take that vision of what the church is meant to be seriously. I don't like the headlines I read in the globe. I don't like the storylines I hear when I talk to people, when they tell me about their church experiences or, or what they had as a child. And that we exist as a church, that we theologically, we believe that a rabbi walked out of the grave and that through that moment, all of history pivoted on that one realization that God in flesh dwelt among us, that God died on a cross and paid and restored and mended the bond that had been broken between he and I because of the things that I have done and who I'd become. And that out of that, love was meant to flow. That our belief in who he is was meant to affect the behavior of how we live. And as a church, we are here to write new headlines. We are here to reclaim the ancient headlines of what the church is meant to be and how the church is meant to live and what the church is meant to do. It's why we give tens of thousands of dollars every single year away, not for this building, not what happens in these four walls, but just to make an impact in our community. And that this past week, we opened up our registration for community events. Because we're hosting one here on December 1st. We just want to create a positive kind of family experience. Give people free pictures of Santa Claus. Give them a really cool adventure checklist for the next 25 days of Christmas. And to make this Christmas special for them. And to strengthen their family and create positive memories no matter where they are. Because we believe people matter to God even if God doesn't matter to people. So we don't have some kind of invisible check system, say, oh, you don't believe what we believe? Well, we, we're not going to do good to you. We believe people matter, period. And that God demonstrated that when he died for people. And so because of that, we, we leverage and we give. And so that community event, it's incredible. Within two hours, over 200 spots were filled up. We had to step back and say, should we have another hour? Because we have 100 people on the waiting list, and, and 24 hours hadn't gone by yet. And it's because we, we have a reputation as a church in this community for the good that we do. And that's just community events. That's not the community service projects we do where people come to this church and say, oh, you're those orange shirt people that we've seen picking up trash. Oh, you're those orange shirt people that we saw painting in the park or helping to purchase that playground equipment. Or you're those orange shirt people who volunteered and helped at that senior citizen's home. Yet we're those orange shirt people because we believe that the resurrected rabbi demonstrated a love and a life that we're meant to, to emulate if we believe he is who he says he is. And that's why I want to encourage you to step in. For those who are part of this faith community, who call Encounter Church Home, I want to ask you to lean in boldly. Because I believe in the next 14 months, it's going to be even better than the last few years. That there is so much good that we are scheming for our community. I think our community, people should wake up in the middle of the night thinking the church is scheming. <laughs> scheming good things. Because if they wake up in the middle of the night, they should know that we're sitting around trying to figure out how can we love them better? How can we serve them better? How can we meet little needs and big needs? How can we step into the lives of people in and around this community? How do we step into the lives of people in this church who can't make ends meet? How do we come alongside of them? How do we do that? And the way that we're going to do that in the next 14 months is a year-end offering that I just want to call Love Does. And that I want to ask you together collectively to step into. It's an offering that 100% of its focus is what happens outside of these four walls. If you're not sure about church, you think I just want your money, good news. Give all you want to that and I don't get any of it. We believe church should be known for what it does for the community, not what it takes from it. And that's why we'll have a bigger egg drop this year than we've ever had before. 
That's why we'll be able to do more in benevolence than we've ever done before. That's why we'll be able to engage and serve our community in ways they've never imagined. It's why next year I'm going to come back up and I'm going to say, hey, I have a free T-shirt for you. I want you to give an hour or an afternoon because I want us to mobilize as an entire family of people and go into our community as those orange shirt people and do this year more than we've ever done in the years before. And start to shift and change the headlines because as a church, we want to be rich. Not that kind of rich. We don't take money and put it in a savings account so for rainy days. We don't live in a place where we're investing money. Every, every bit that comes into the church goes out of the church. Because we see in Jesus and his example what our lives are meant to look like. We recognize at the end of the day that there is a life that's worth living that invests in more than just treasures that one day become trinkets. It's about investing in people who will live forever. And I want to invite you back next week, after you have an awesome Thanksgiving, to come back here, because I want to talk about how you individually, practically, can start to do this daily. Because there's a lot in this passage. And so next week, I want to tell you a big story that Jesus told, and talk about how you and I individually can start to live a life that's rich. As we collectively give towards what God wants to do in and through this church in our community, as we as a church are rich too. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for who you are, for what you've done, for how you, out of the generosity of people throughout history, have made a difference. And that we don't do this, we don't even talk about what we want to do because we want people to notice the church. We do this because we want people to notice you. We want people to see you in us because we believe that who you are and what you've done is worth our lives being changed because of it. And that it's a privilege to serve, it's a privilege to sacrifice, it's a privilege to give and to be a part of laying up treasures and living our lives with a confidence that carries from this life into the next. And it's in your name, Jesus, that I pray, that I celebrate, and that we thank you in advance. Amen. We're going to close out today um, the way we close out every week, with a song, just to give us a little bit of breathing room to process. And uh, through that time, we'll, we'll take up and kind of we'll stand up, and you'll see our team moving around. And it's because people who call Encounter Church home are really generous. And so during that moment, we, we use that as a way to practice that generosity. But I also recognize that maybe today you've been sitting in this room and you've been hearing these words about rich and you've been hearing these words about giving and you are in a place where you don't have anything. And that we don't advertise it. We don't ask people to come up on stage and say, hey, can you tell us, can you tell everybody what the church has done for you? But just know, as I was talking today, that the generosity of those around you allow us to step into your situation with you. We may not be able to fix all of your problems, but we can walk with you. We can support you. We can kind of extend generosity to you. That we, we set aside money, part of the money that comes in through the love offering, for the ability to help people buy groceries for their family, to help them buy gas for their car, to help them make ends meet. Because sometimes, sometimes you just don't have anything. And so if that's you today, whether it's in the app or just come by starting point, we want to step in with you. And that ultimately where all of this comes down to, what Paul was trying to move us to is not just an idea of wealth, He's trying to remind us ultimately about our hope and our trust and our security. That our confidence is not in our pay grade, it's not in our job, our confidence is not in a check or a card that we have. The confidence that we have is the belief that God came, demonstrated his love, and broke the power of sin and death, destroyed the things that have held us in chains, and that through him, 
in trusting in Him and our faith in Him, we can experience freedom. We can experience hope. We can have confidence. We can stand in a place of want. We can stand in a place of plenty and know that God has provided in every single season. There have been places and seasons in my life where I wasn't sure how we were going to provide for health care for our family, how we were going to eat the next day. And I can tell you confidently, look at me. There's never been a day where I haven't had food. God has always, always been faithful. And so today, whether you're in that place of richness and you have to make a choice of whether or not you want to move towards this place of being rich or whether you're in a place of what feels like devastating poverty and you're not sure that all of us today can take that step of trust, to take that step of faith and realize because what he has done, because of what he has broken through, that we can be well, that we can stand firm, that we can have a confidence. And so I want to invite you to stand up. And our team is going to lead us in a song that we've sung before, a song that I think is appropriate as we wrap up this conversation around richness. And it's a song about Him and our response to Him in every single season of life, an ability for us to say that it is well, that in the good and the bad and the bright and the dark and everything in between, We have a confidence that's greater and that's stronger. Let's sing.
with my soul It is well With my soul It is well With my soul It is well It is well With my soul Thank you for being here today at Encounter Church. We hope that you have an incredible Thanksgiving. Uh, before you go, if you're interested, if, if you want to know more about the offering or how you can give to that, it's in the app on our website, encounterchurch.com forward slash give. You can see the year-end offering tab when you start with the financial piece. Um, if you're in that place with benevolence, please let us know. Swing by starting point today. Let's start that conversation, okay? Again, it's a private conversation. No one will know, but we want to step in with you. And, um, and if you're interested, if you're wanting to find financial freedom, I don't care how bad you think you are right now, how messed up your finances are. I promise you, if you give two hours today to our financial freedom seminar, you will start to move towards financial freedom. And so you can sign up in the app. You can sign up by swinging by starting point. It's one to three o'clock today. It's free and it will help you move towards freedom. But the last thing, this is really big. Come here. This guy right here, okay? Yes. We love this guy. Um, many of you, you don't know him, you don't know his story, but you've fallen in love with him, with his voice and the way that he leads you week in and week out. He's so humble, you see how he just tried to hide again? Step back up, okay? Um, so today is his last day. Yeah, Michael um, is, is an incredibly gifted musician, vocalist, guitarist. Um, he is an incredibly gifted guy who has dreams and abilities. And so he's actually tomorrow moving to Nashville. And so there's a, yes. 
And so maybe one day you'll be able to support and let him know how much you love him by downloading his tracks and buying his albums and saying, I knew him back when. But what's cool is what happens on this stage started with Michael. The first member of this team on this stage was Michael. He was an anchor. He's been a voice that for many of you for years has encouraged you, has lifted you up. And we didn't want him sneaking out today because he's humble enough. He would just slide out and go on and like go big in Nashville and release an album and never tell anybody because he's just humble. He would leave gigs on Saturday night, drive hours through the night just to be here on Sunday mornings. He is an incredible guy and we love him deeply and we wanted to give you a chance to just tell him how much you love him, to tell him how grateful you are. I told him earlier, we may be singing it is well, but it is not well with me that he's leaving. So before you leave today, if, if he's been an encouragement to you, if he's been an inspiration for you at any point, just sw swing by, give him a hug, give him a high five, tell him how much you're going to miss him. Tell him the story that you've always wished you would tell him because today's the day. And uh, like you said earlier, he's not dying and there are planes, so we will see him again. But we just wanted to make sure as we go into a week of celebrating what we're grateful for as a nation, we wanted to tell Michael how grateful we are for him. So have a great day. We hope you have a wonderful week. And we'll see you next week at Encounter Church. God bless.